So today's my topic of lecture is water microbiology. Before we get into the detailing of this topic, water microbiology, let's get a brief introduction about water microbiology. Water, as we know, it is essential for the cellular activities of all living organisms. Living organisms means here it can be we human beings as well as microorganisms. So, water microbiology is normally concerned with the microorganisms that are normally present in water, or it can be transported from one habitat to another through water. Normally, water can support the growth of many types of microorganisms, which are generally or broadly classified as advantageous and unhealthy microorganisms. Coming to advantageous microorganisms, these are those bacteria or microbes that normally digest the different types of organic matter or the toxins that are present in water as a pollutant and decrease the level of pollution in the water. So they are advantageous. The unhealthy of the pathogenic microorganisms are all those microorganisms that cause the gastrointestinal diseases. Now moving on to the types of water or the, what are the sources of water from where we get water to drink or to use in our daily activities. Water can originate from the groundwater which is generally obtained only when we dig deep wells. It is deeper into the soil here and in this case the soil function as a filter and therefore it is virtually free from microbes. Surface water is generally the water which we get from streams, lakes and shallow wells. Moving on to the zonation of surface water that is lakes. Lakes are generally divided into three zones, littoral zone, pelagic zone and benthic zone. Before getting into the detailing of the zonation, let's go to the diagrammatic representation of the three zones. This is the zone which is known as the benthic zone. This particular zone is the anaerobic zone of the muddy layer of the lakes where normally oxygen availability is less and so where only the anaerobic microorganisms are obtained that generally produce methane gas. Littoral zone is the zone of the lakes where the water part need to the land part of the lakes. Here the diverse forms of microorganisms as well as plants and animals are available. The diverse form of these plants give protections or shelter to the animals that are present in this zone. Moving on to the phylogen zone. Phylogen zone is the middle, deeper layer of the water which is further divided into limited zone and profundal zone. Limited zone is the zone where the light is properly available. So up to that zone we can get the photosynthetic microorganisms. Other than that, in the profundal zone, there is no photosynthetic bacteria available. Normally where the heterotrophs or the chemosynthetic organisms are found. Now, once we have decided where we get from the sources of water to drink, now it comes to the point how these water sources get contaminated. Before getting into the contamination detailing, we first find what are the three other sources of water. First is the rainwater. Normally the rainwater is free from any contaminants, but when we come in contact with the air, the pollutants which are present in the air may contaminate the rainwater. So we can say that more and more the air is polluted, more and more the rainwater will get contaminated. Surface water such as lakes and streets normally get the majority of the contamination from the waste that are disposed of from the agriculture and industry. Groundwater, as it is discussed previously, it is usually safe to drink because they do not contain any contaminants bacteria because here the soil function as a filter and can eliminate the microbes present in the soil. So, the groundwater is normally contaminated with the heavy metals such as arsenic, selenium or boron. Next topic, how does water get contaminated? There are various ways that can contaminate the water such as if you improperly disposed of chemicals, 
animal waste, pesticides, human waste as well as agricultural waste to water, they may contaminate your water. Now, what sort of contaminants are added to water is generally categorized into four categories. First is the aesthetic contaminants. These are the substances that generally impart taste, odor, smell to the water such as sand, dirt or minerals. Second category is the biological contaminants. Those are generally the pathogenic microorganisms that can affect the human health causing different types of gastrointestinal diseases. Chemical contaminants are the volatile organic compounds such as pesticides and herbicides which are added for the agricultural cultivation and next is the dissolved solids which are the minerals such as calcium, magnesium and heavy metals such as arsenic and mercury. Before getting to the detailing of the chapter, we should be familiar with some of the terms that may come in the, in the next section such as Portable water. What do you mean by portable water? Portable water is the water that is fit for the drinking consumption and any substance that is un, that is objectionable such as materials that are pathogens, materials that add odors or different types of taste to the waters or toxins or radioactive substances makes the water unfit for drinking purpose and in that case we can say that particular water is non-portable water. So portable water in other words is the clean water that is fit for consumption, consumption and it does not contain any objectionable substances. Objectionable substances here does not mean that only the pathogens or toxins has to be present. It can be any substance that make the water unfit for drinking purpose. And any substance when added to the water makes the water non Portable is known as pollutants and the process of addition of these pollutants is known as pollution. Various types of microorganisms are found in, in water as we have previously discussed but these microorganisms differ on what type of water you are dealing with. If you are dealing with unpolluted water, normally as the points discuss, the unpolluted water is low in organic matter content, so they are low in nutrients, so bacterial load will also be very less. Normally the bacteria which are found in this non-polluted water are actinomycetes and different autotropic bacteria as well as free living protozoa such as euglena or paramecium. Polluted water. Polluted water as previously discussed contain huge amount of pollutants which can be organic in nature. As the organic matter content is high, the microbes usually present in this particular water is also high and generally they belong to the heterotropic organisms that feed on these organic matter. When they try to digest this organic matter and use it as a source of carbon and energy, they generally utilize the dissolved oxygen present in water and can make the environment unfit for the growth of fish and other aquatic animals. These microorganisms in the absence of oxygen trying to digest this organic matter result in the accumulation of acid, bases, alcohols and various gases. Next is marine water. Marine water is always high in salt concentration and generally has a low temperature. So generally halophilic organisms that can tolerate high salt concentration and psychophilic organisms that can survive at low temperature generally predominant in these water. Moving on to waterborne pathogens and waterborne diseases. Now what are waterborne pathogens? Waterborne pathogens are the causative agents of various diseases that are generally transmitted through water. Waterborne pathogens generally belong to the following three categories that is bacteria, virus, protozoa and helminths. These bacteria, virus and protozoa, these three are the major contaminants that cause different types of waterborne diseases. Moving to the waterborne diseases, Waterborne diseases are the disease that are generally transmitted through water 
or when you are ingesting any food that is contaminated with water and may cause various types of gastrointestinal diseases and the causative agent can be either bacteria, virus or protozoa. Each and every waterborne diseases have some symptoms in common. These are the most important diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, nausea and vomiting, dehydration, loss of appetite and weakness. Now, what are the common causes of these waterborne diseases? Waterborne diseases are generally caused if the water that you are consuming is generally contaminated with the waterborne pathogens or in other cases you are coming in contact with the waste products which are added to the water through feces that is contaminated with water. The most common waterborne disease is Typhoid. Typhoid is the most common bacterial waterborne disease that is caused by Salmonella typhi. The common symptoms of typhoid fever is obviously high fever, extreme weakness, skin rashes with small red spots, loss of appetite, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps. These are the common symptoms. Once this is diagnosed, normally typhoid fever is diagnosed through blood samples or the urine samples which is checked for the presence of Salmonella typhi. Once the Salmonella typhi has been detected, antibiotics are soon administered so that the particular infected person can fight the infection. The patient is also prescribed to have the oral rehydration solution and in severe emergency they are given intravenous rehydration solution too. The second most important waterborne disease is cholera. It is also a bacterial waterborne disease which is caused by bacterium Vibrio cholerae. It is also having the common symptoms like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps and normally they have a rice colored loose stools. Treatment of cholera is simple rehydration that is drinking lot and lot of fluids so that you may get rehydrated as your body uses too much of fluids during this infection. If emergency arises, you can be prescribed the intravenous fluids too so that you are severely hydrated. Next is antibiotics and zinc supplements are also given to counter or build resistance to this infection. Next is giardiasis. It is a parasitic infection or we can say the protozoan waterborne disease which is caused by giardia lamblia. The root of this particular protozoa is a fecal oral root and normally they affect the small intestine. So it has also the symptoms of gastrointestinal disease. The common symptoms are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, weight loss, extreme tiredness. Hepatitis B, this is a waterborne disease that is transmitted through water and it is generally caused by hepatitis A which is the subtype of hepatitis B virus and it generally leads to the inflammation of liver and temporarily affects the liver function. It has a jaundice like symptom such as yellowish skin as you see in jaundice, fever, fatigue, abdominal pain, light colored stools, loss of appetite, diarrhea etc. Amebiasis, it is the second protozoan disease which is caused by enter amoeba histolytica. It is also infecting the small intestine and causing more or less the same symptoms as caused by the different waterborne pathogens. Now once you get that you, your water that you are consuming is contaminated or you are desiring to prevent the waterborne diseases, what are the steps you should practice? You should always practice these four common steps that is practice environmental hygiene. That means once you use a public toilet, you should flush it properly and wash your hands properly. Practice good personal hygiene when you itself dealing with any food items or you are cooking, try to wash your hands before that. Practice food safety precautions. In this case, you should properly wash your fruits and vegetables. You should properly cook the food 
Avoid eating raw food materials. Fourth is consume the properly treated water. If you are drinking water in public places, try to drink the bottled water or boiled water or filtered water. Now, once you get the idea that the water you are drinking is contaminated with pathogens, now how will you find which pathogens is present or which pathogen is heavily polluting your water. It is not possible to detect a particular pathogen from your water sample. So we go for the indicator organisms which are microorganisms whose presence indicate that pathogens may also be present in this particular water and this particular water may not be fit for drinking purpose. These indicator organisms are normally non-pathogenic organisms that are present in the water but they do not multiply in water and these particular microorganisms can easily be detected by performing simple biochemical tests. For an ideal indicator organism, these indicator organisms should have some characteristics of their own. And what are the characteristics or the criteria? As we have known about the indicator organisms or what are indicator organisms, now you have to know which of the characteristics makes an ideal indicator organisms. So these are the different characteristics which are discussed briefly. The indicator organism concept should be useful for all types of the water you are dealing with. It can be drinking water, it can be wastewater or recreational water as seawater. It should be present whenever the intestinal pathogens are present and it should be absent when the intestinal pathogens are absent. So, the indicator organism is a signal that if a water contains these indicator organisms, it must contain the intestinal pathogens too. It should survive longer in the environment but should not grow in the water bodies and they generally have the survival time greater than that of the toughest enteric pathogen. The detection procedure of these particular microbes are very easy and it is also inexpensive. Density of the indicator microorganisms gives you the idea that the particular water bodies is heavily polluted with the fecal materials. And the last criteria is it should be the intestinal microflora of a warm-blooded animals. Why? Now, why is indicator organisms important? When we are dealing with the waterborne pathogens, firstly, the waterborne pathogens are numerous in numbers. So, you do not have an idea, the, your, your selection should begin with which of the pathogens. Suppose you are selecting any one of the waterborne pathogens and trying to find its presence in the water, but that particular sample does not contain that particular pathogen. It does not mean that the water is not contaminated. Second important point that has to be overcome through the indicator organism is individual pathogen numbers is very low in the water bodies, so it cannot be easily selected. Third, Isolation and detection of many waterborne pathogens requires several days or weeks or months to get detected. At that time, you can be continuously cons consuming that water and may get infected with different types of gastrointestinal disease. So better you go for any indicator organisms that is non-pathogenic and its presence shows that that particular water is contaminated. So, normally as an indicator organisms which go for coliforms. Now, coliform bacteria are the indicator organisms which are generally present in the intestinal tract of a warm-blooded animals and their presence in the drinking water gives you a signal that there must be some contamination route through which the pathogenic and waterborne pathogens may get entry into the water bodies and that particular water is not fit for consumption. Now this coliforms bacteria, if you 
see its classification normally the test that you use for detections of coliform gives you a total coliform count the total coliforms are categorized as a combination of a fecal coliform and a non fecal coliform now total coliforms include all those bacteria that are generally found in water in soil as well as in human and animal excreta Fecal coliforms are those group of total coliforms that are specifically found in the intestinal tract of the warm-blooded animals. Moving on to Escherichia coli, it is the one of the member of fecal coliforms that are generally predominating in the intestinal tract of the human beings, and when discarded in the environment, they are not found growing and reproducing in the environment. Coliform groups are generally classified as Enterobacteria, Streptococcus, Enterococcus. All these organisms are capable of fermenting lactose, producing acid and gas. Moving on to Enterobacteria, it is the most important category of the coliform groups. They are generally facultative anaerobic, rod-shaped bacteria, capable of fermenting lactose, producing acid and gas. At 37 degree Celsius, the common Enterobacteria genera are Enterobacter, Klebsiella, Citronella, and Escherichia. Besides that, there are also Streptococcus and Enterococcus genera also that also belongs to the coliform group. Once the coliform bacteria has been studied or you have an idea about the indicator organisms next is how will you enumerate the numbers of organisms that are generally present in the water bodies for enumeration methods we select the these three basic methods the standard plate count most probable number and membrane filtration moving on to the first method that is standard plate count the standard plate count of the bacteria generally gives you the idea of the total living organisms that is present in water bodies in this particular method you normally perform a serial dilution method where the normal water bodies is first serially diluted so that the microbes content in the water is reduced to a level that on plating that particular dilution you get a well isolated colonies in the plates that can be counted if you directly plate the original sample you may get a lawn and it is unable to count the bacteria or get a cfu count in this particular case so first the heavily polluted water is serially diluted nearly we dilute about 10 to the power minus 6 dilution from the last 2 to 3 dilution we do the plating where we use the medium nutrient agar you plate the serially diluted sample to the nutrient agar plate incubate at 37 degrees celsius for 24 hours and then after the incubation period is complete we count for the observed colonies on the plate each of the colonies are then multiplied with the dilution factor and you will get at the approximate count of the bacteria that is present in the original sample keep in mind standard plate count does not give the idea of coliforms it generally gives the idea of total viable organisms or viable bacteria that is present in the water sample these are the image where you can see that once you are increasing the dilution the number of colonies are decreasing and it can be easily counted you should keep in mind that the plate containing less than 30 cfu and the plate containing more than 300 colonies is to be discarded second method is the most probable number this method is used to detect the presence of coliforms in the water and this gives a rough idea of the total coliforms present in water this particular method once shows the presence of coliforms in water you can get a idea that that particular water may have a fecal contamination route npn test includes three levels of testing presumptive test confirmed test completed test first we are moving to the presumptive test the principle of presumptive test is the given water sample is added to a lactose broth tube that is containing an inverted durham's tube 
the water sample if contains coliforms normally ferment the lactose producing acid and gas the dynamo tube is added just to detect the presence of the gas as because you can see the bubbles has been formed in the dynamo tube if there is production of gases in this particular method for the determination of npn count we take 15 culture tubes each of the tubes containing lactose broth the 15 tubes are divided into three sets each of the set containing five tubes all the tubes must contain the inverted durham tube the durham tube should be completely filled with media and it should not contain any air bubbles before the start of the experiment the three sets are inoculated with different volumes of water the first five tubes are inoculated with 10 ml sample second five is inoculated with 1 ml sample and the third set of five tubes are inoculated with 0.1 ml sample the entire setup is placed in a incubator at 37 degrees celsius for 24 hours after the period of incubation is complete we just take out the tubes and see for the positive tubes that means the tubes that has formed the air bubbles in the durham tube this is the procedure you can see the five test tubes was initially inoculated with 10 ml 1 ml and 0.1 ml sample after the period of incubation you can see the first five tubes the all the tubes are containing the air bubbles it is not clear from this image i can show you in the board that the durham tube contain if it contains air bubbles this is the medium that is completely filled this is the portion where you can see the bubbles else the whole of the tube is filled with the medium this is your air bubbles and this particular air bubbles signifies that the presumptive test is positive after you find this air bubbles you should give a count which of the tubes are showing your positive result for example in this you are getting five positive tubes because all the tubes are containing bubbles second set is containing two positive tubes other than that the other three is no bubbles are present and the last setup is containing zero positive tubes now you have a data of 5 2 0 this is your data you will put it in the npn table and search for the number of coliforms that is present as you can see from the table 5 2 1 1 shows that 49 coliforms is present in 100 ml of the water sample so this particular process gives you a idea that if the coliform is present whether the water is potable or not once you get a positive result in the presumptive test you have to further move to the confirmed test this process is very necessary because every time you get a positive result for the presumptive test does not signifies the presence of coliforms in that particular water sample because there is a process which is synergistic action the synergistic action is the association of two microorganisms it can be a combination of gram positive and gram negative that normally ferment lactose producing acid and gas so synergistic action is the association of two microorganisms gram positive and gram negative together they can ferment lactose producing acid and gas the same process also occurs for coliforms but that in that case we know that coliforms are the gram negative bacteria capable of fermenting lactose now when you get a positive result for the npn test how will you be sure that it is because of the coliforms or due to the synergistic action to get a confirmed idea we move to the second level of testing which is a confirmed test where you take two mediums 
EMB and endo. The full form of EMB is eosin methylene blue agar and the endo agar plates. Both these media function as selective media as well as differential media. These two plates are used for confirmed test where the plates are streaked with the inoculum that you get from the positive tubes of the NPN result. That means the presumptive test positive tubes are used as inoculum and you full of culture is taken and streaked on the EMD and endo other plates so that they can confound you the presence of the gram positive or gram negative association or due to the coliforms. In this particular plate, after you streak and incubate the plates at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours, you may get an observation that the plates may contain colonies or may not contain colonies. If the plate contains the colonies on the endo or the EMD other plates, so the confirmed test endo and EMD other plates are used and in those plates the inoculum used is generally the positive tubes that you have got from the presumptive test. Loopful of culture is streaked on both the plates. The plates are incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours and we will observe for the appearance of the colonies in these particular plates. After the incubation period if you contain or if you observe the colonies on the plates it confirms that the presumptive test was positive due to the presence of coliforms. If no colonies obtained on the place, it signifies that the presumptive test was a false presumptive test. There was no coliforms present in the water sample and it was simply due to the synergistic action between a gram positive and a gram negative bacteria. Together they were capable of fermenting lactose producing acid and gas. Now how they are confirming that the coliforms are present or it is due to the synergistic action between a gram positive and a gram negative bacteria. As the term used here is selective media as well as differential media, endo and EMD other plates, both the plates contain stains. The stains generally inhibit the growth of gram positive bacteria and allows the gram negative bacteria grow properly. But in this case, they were capable of growing in the plates because of this association. When the stain is present in the medium, the stain is inhibiting the growth of gram positive bacteria. In this case, gram negative alone is not capable of fermenting lactose producing acid and gas. So it is not able to grow in this particular plate solely alone. Whereas in case of coliforms, as because it is a gram negative bacteria, stains have no effects on the coliforms. It can grow properly and can develop colonies on that particular plate. Basis of this you are selecting gram negative over gram positive bacteria. These mediums are functioning as a selective media. Now moving on to differential media. These two mediums can differentiate between two varieties of coliforms. The two varieties may show different colored colonies on the plates and getting the idea of a light colored colonies or a deep colored colonies or the colonies with metallic sheen or without metallic sheen, we can conclude that the water samples may contain the coliforms and can there can be a two variety of coliforms which we have previously discussed. It can be a fecal coliforms or a non-fecal coliforms or a combination of both that is present in water. Once the coliforms is detected in the confirmed test, we move on to the last level of testing that is your completed test. Completed test is generally performed to just reconfirm that the colonies that are growing on the endo or the EMD other plates are again capable of fermenting lactose producing acid and gas. And secondly, we are trying to find out the organisms that are growing on the endo and the EMD other plates has the gram negative characters on the morphology is short rods or not. To get this confirmation, we do the completed test. Two types of media are used, lactose bird containing Durham's tube and nutrient agar gland. Both the tubes are inoculated with the colonies that are obtained on the endo 
or the EMD agar plates and after the incubation period is done, we go for the observation whether the Durham's tube is containing any air bubbles or not. That means the gas formation is positive and we are gram staining with the sample that has been grown in a nutrient agar slant. If the gram character is gram negative and if the morphology is short rods, it is confirmed that it is coliforms. So this is the flow chart of the confirmed test and the completed the test that has been discussed. You can see the presumptive test is non negative, so this sample is discarded. If the presumptive test is positive, you can see the bubbles in the Durham's tube. That particular positive tube is strict on the endo or the AMD other plates. After the period of incubation, if you get the colonies, that means the confirmed test is positive or the previously done presumptive test contains coliforms, it has been confirmed. Next, they are inoculated again into the lactose growth tube containing Durham's tube and a nutrient other slant. This portion is a completed test. These are the observations we get when you streak a loopful of a culture on the endo other plates or the EMB other plates. The left side shows the image of the colonies on the in the other plates, this is the growth of E. coli where you can see the deep violet color colonies with a greenish metallic sheen. Enterobacter aerogens have a pale pink colored colonies without any metallic sheen. So in the same media, depending on the colony characteristics, you can differentiate between a fecal coliforms and a non-fecal coliforms. This is the image of the endo other place where the E. coli is growing with a deep pink colored colonies and a golden metallic sheen. This is the observation of the completed test. This is the image of the gram stained smear where you can see that the organism is gram negative in character as it is retaining the color of saffroning and the short rods arranged singly, some in pairs. The third step is membrane filtration technique. This membrane filtration technique is always opted for those water samples that are in large volumes and we know that the bacterial content is less. In this particular method, filter is used which is known as membrane filter whose porosity is size 0.45 micrometer. This porosity is sufficient to restrict the bacterial cells in the membrane. It cannot pass to the filter. That particular filter is then placed in the selective media as EMB or endo. It is incubated at two different temperatures. 35 degrees Celsius if you are trying to determine the presence of total coliform and 44.5 degrees Celsius if you are trying to determine the presence of the fecal coliforms. You can count the colonies and you can get a brief idea that how much of the cells are present in the original sample. <coughs> This is the diagrammatic representation, this funnel like structures and this conical flask, the whole setup has to be sterile. Filter is placed in this junction. This is a vacuum pump through which you can speed up the filtering process. Water to be estimated for the presence of the coliforms or to get a count of bacteria is filtered through this setup. The membrane after the process of filtration is done is transferred to a nutrient other medium or an any selective media that is endo or EMB incubated and the colonies obtained are then counted. This is the image of the endo other place where the membrane filter has been placed. There are some advantages of this membrane filter techniques. The first advantage is you can detect the presence of bacteria in a large sample volumes that contains less amount of bacteria. It has a low chance of contamination. The process is very rapid and you get a result within 24 hours that is greater as no time is required for the NPN count. This particular method is very rapid and more than 100 samples can be tested by the membrane filtration technique. Now once you get an idea that the water samples contain coliforms, now there is a point you have to differentiate the coliforms as a fecal coliforms or a non-fecal coliforms. So normally the differentiation of fecal and the non-fecal coliform is done by in-week test. 
Now, what is MVIC test? MVIC test is a group of four biochemical tests that together helps to detect the presence of fecal and non-fecal coliforms. The full form of MVIC is I stands for indole test, N stands for methyl red test, V stands for Vox-Proskur and C stands for citrate test. Moving on to the first test that is the indole test. In this particular test, tryptone broth is used that contain the amino acid tryptophan. The colonies that are obtained on the endo or the EMB agar plates are used as an inoculum and the tryptone broth is inoculated with that particular organism incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. If the organism produces the enzyme tryptophanase, this particular enzyme degrades tryptophan, releasing indole side chain, pyruvate and ammonium. During the period of incubation, the particular organism secrete this enzyme in the medium. The enzyme degrades tryptophan, releasing indole. After the incubation period is done, the indole produced in the medium is detected with the reagent used that is known as the COVAX reagent. This particular COVAX reagent contain an important component which is known as paradimethyl aminobenzaldehyde. This paradimethyl aminobenzaldehyde react with indole forming a red coloration or a red color pink colored ring at the top of the medium as you can see from the figure. Covax reagent contains the important component paradimethyl aminobenzaldehyde that react with the indole side chain producing a red or a pink colored layer at the top of the medium. If you get a red or a pink colored layer, the result is positive or you can say the indole test is positive. If you do not get that red coloration, the result is negative. As it is clear from the figure, the negative result shows a yellow colored layer and the positive result shows a red or pink colored layer. Moving on to the methyl red test. Methyl red test is also performed with the same colonies that are obtained on the endo or the EMB other plates. The medium used here is glucose spectrum broth. The principle behind methyl red test is the glucose present in the medium is fermented by the inoculated microorganisms producing either acid or a combination of acid and a non-acidic product that is acetyl methyl cardinal. If the organism produce only acids, the pH of the medium suddenly drop from 7 to pH 4. And if it produce a combination of acid and a acetyl methyl carbonyl, then the pH drops slightly to pH 6. Now, methyl red is a pH indicator that is added to the broth after the completion of the incubation period. When methyl red is added, the test tubes which shows a red coloration tells us that the test result is positive and the test tube showing the yellow coloration tells us that the methyl red test is negative. The positive results confirms you that the organism is fermenting glucose producing completely acid and the yellow tube confirms you that the organism is fermenting glucose producing combination of acid and a acetyl methyl carbonyl. Third test is vox proskur test where again the same medium glucose spectrum broth is used and this particular test is performed to detect the formation of acetyl methyl carbonyl in the medium. So in this particular test the same colonies are picked up from the endo or the AMB other plates and inoculated into the glucose spectrum broth. After the incubation period is over the presence of acetyl methyl carbonyl in the test tubes are detected by adding two reagents, 40% KOH and 5% alpha naphthol. 40% KOH when added to the tube oxidize acetyl methyl carbonyl to diacetyl. The diacetyl then further react with the arginine residue present in the pectone of the medium as well as with alpha naphthol producing a red coloration.
So the formation of red coloration in the test detects or confirms a positive test and the yellow coloration confirms a negative result. The positive result confirms you that acetyl methyl carbonyl is formed and the negative result confirms you that acetyl methyl carbonyl is not formed in the tubes. Last test is the citrate test. In this particular medium, cinnamon citrate hour is used that contains citrate as a sole source of carbon and bromothinyl blue as a pH indicator. In this particular organism, the slant is also streaked with the same inoculum that has been growing on the endo on and on the AMB agar plates. After the incubation period is done, we just observe the slant for the change in the coloration. The principle behind this is that if the organism is capable of using citrate as a sole source of carbon, it oxidizes the citrate resulting in the formation of carbon dioxide. That particular carbon dioxide reacts with the sodium ions present in the medium forming sodium carbonate that results in the alkaline pH that turns the pH indicator bromothinyl blue from green to blue coloration. So blue coloration is a positive result and no change in the color of this land is a negative result. So this is the result of Invict test at a glance. You can see indole test is positive if wet coloration occurs, no color change, it is negative. Methyl red test if develops a red coloration, it is positive. Yellow color development is a negative result. Vox Prosker, a pink or red color development is positive. Yellow color development is a negative result. And citric test, if the blue color develops from green color, it is positive. And if no color change, it is negative. This is the Invict test result of Entero E. coli, which is a fecal coliform. As you can see from the figure, indole test is positive, methyl red is positive, Vox Prosper is negative, citrate test is negative. This is the observation of fecal coliform. This is the observation of non-fecal coliform, enterobacter aerogens, indole test negative, methyl red negative, VP test is positive, citrate test is positive. So once you get an idea that the water is contaminated, now you should keep in mind that that water, contaminated water should be properly treated so that you can remove all the contaminants that are present in water and that makes your control measures. Under control measures, we will deal with all the methods that will remove the contaminants from the water sample. Normally, we treat the water sample for two major reasons. First, to remove the contaminants that causes health-related hazards to our body. Those contaminants are known as health-related contaminants. And to remove the contaminants that make the water taste bad, it smells bad, or there is a bad odor, such as the aesthetic contaminants. It has to be removed from the water. Health-related contaminants, you can see it is classified as acute contaminants or chronic contaminants. Acute contaminants are those contaminants which when present at a very low levels can cause the gastrointestinal diseases and the chronic contaminants are the contaminants which requires a prolonged exposure to cause the diseases. So these are the basic treatment processes. Here I am specifically mentioning the process of potable water because we are dealing here with the potable water. There are also treatment processes that are used for the sewage water or the waste water which is not discussed in this topic. So when we are treating a potable water, the water treatment requires three major processes of which Chemical and physical process is the main process. Sometimes the biological process is also required to remove the contaminants. So we will generally focus on the chemical and the physical process for treating the water to make it fit for drinking purpose. Chemical process involves oxidation, coagulation and disinfection. Physical process involves flocculation, sedimentation, filtration, disinfection using ultraviolet light. Now which process will be selected or which order will be followed, it depends on the type of the contaminants and the strength of the contaminants present in water. The chemical process we are dealing with 
The first process is oxidation, where different types of oxidants are used, such as mentioned here, the most commonly used oxidants are chlorine and potassium permanganate, and to a lesser extent, you can use ozone and chlorine dioxide too. In chemical oxidation method, the water is normally treated with the chemical oxidant to remove the contaminants such as iron, manganese or arsenic, or in other words, you can say to remove the inorganic contaminants from the water so that you can make the water taste better or you can remove the odor causing compounds from the water. If you do the oxidation process before exposing the water to coagulation, it can also remove the particles and may improve the process of coagulation. Second process is the coagulation process where you add some chemicals that function as coagulants. Now what is coagulation or why do we require coagulation? When you are dealing with the water, water bodies, the heavy materials that are suspended in water, they normally settle down due to weight. But there are some particles that are lesser in size of 1 micrometer and they normally do not settle down, they remain suspended in the water bodies because they are too small to settle and they impart different types of color or turbidity to the water bodies. These materials are known as colloidal materials. Now colloidal materials normally do not settle down by its own. They have to be settled down by adding some chemicals to it. Now, colloidal materials are classified into two categories. Hydrophobic, we know that hydrophobic are water-hating particles and hydrophilic are the water-loving particles. Hydrophobic materials that function as a colloidal materials are mostly inorganic particles that generally contribute to the turbidity of the water and it causes a negative surface electrical charge or it carries a negative electrical charge on the particles. Hydrophilic means water loving. Water loving colloidal particles are generally composed of organic material and they are the common source of color to the water. Hydrophobic compounds are generally surrounded by the water molecules and therefore they also have a negatively charged particles. As because the particles are negatively charged, they repel each other and are unable to settle down. It is clear from the figure you can see that hydrophobic particles are carrying negative charge and they are repelling each other. Once you are adding the coagulants, the coagulant addition may decrease the stability of the colloidal materials and allow them to form the larger particles which is known as agglomerate where the co coagulants which are added normally neutralizing the negative charge of the hydrophobic as well as hydrophilic colloidal particles. No commonly used coagulants are aluminium sulfate, the common name is alum, sodium aluminate, ferric sulfate, ferrous sulfate, etc. Moving on to the physical process is flocculation. Once the water has been treated with coagulants and agglomerate or flock has been formed, Flocculation process is the process where you are allowing the slowly mix up of the coagulated water. So there is a probability of head on collision with the particles resulting in the formation of more larger particles that settle down forming a well defined flux. Flocculants that are generally used for this purpose are anionic polymers which generally aid or help in the formation of a good flock that increase the speed of flocculation as well as settling of the flock. Second physical process is sedimentation where from the figure you can see that once the flock has been formed, it gains a maximum size and if you give them the time to settle down, it will settle down and it will form sediment. In case of water treatment, that sediment is known as sludge. The sedimentation process can be a 
applied before application of coagulation or can be done after the process of coagulation or flocculation. If the sedimentation process is done before the coagulation process, it normally reduces the suspended particles concentration in the water bodies so that less amount of coagulants are required for the coagulation process. And if the sedimentation process is followed after coagulation and flocculation, in that case, it will reduce the suspended particles to a level so that the next subsequent process which is filtration can be done more effectively. Next process is filtration. Again here the membrane filters are used. You can see there are different varieties of membrane filters. Each of the filters have different porosity and each of the filters have different capability to restrict the particles. For example, membrane which filtration has the large size porosity, so it can restrict the movement of the larger pathogens. Whereas the reverse osmosis, the membrane filters are capable of removing the smallest size of the particles because it has a pore size less than 0 0.0001 micrometers. This is a diagrammatic representation where you can see that in the microfiltration, the water molecules can move easily, monovalent ions can move easily, multivalent ions can move easily, viruses also can move easily, but the restricted movement is for bacteria and suspended solids. Last, reverse osmosis you can see that only the purified water can move through the filter as all the particles are restricted from moving inside the water bodies. So in that case, you can see that this filter is the best filter you can select. Lastly, disinfection. Once all the physical and the chemical process is done, and if you are not sure that the pathogenic microorganisms are either present or not, you can first check the presence of the coliforms bacteria by doing the NPN test, like such as presumptive and confirmed test. And next, you can process, proceed to the disinfection process where you can use some chemicals or physical radiation to disinfectant your water bodies. That means you are in, inactivating all the disease causing microorganisms present in the water bodies. So disinfection in this topic is done using the physical radiation that is ultraviolet light. You can also go for chemical disinfectant such as chlorine. When you are using a chemical disinfectant, it is normally damaging the cellular structures of the microorganisms and hindering its growth. And when you are opting for the UV light for inactivation of the microorganisms, UV light directly inactivate the nucleic acid of the microorganisms and make it impossible to infect the host cell. For viruses to inactivate, the UV dosage is always greater than that required for protozoa or bacteria. So this completes my today's class. Thank you very much.